Hello everyone, MJ Hobby Corner here, and uh, today is Thursday, um, and uh, things are a bit cold in the studio. I'm waiting for it to warm up. Uh, last night we had uh, temperatures were in the 20s, and so uh, things got a little chilly in the studio. So uh, just cranked up the heat in there, and hopefully then I will be able to film my uh, game. Uh, for today and I should have that game up by tomorrow Friday uh, I will be playing one page rules regiments for the very first time in 15 millimeter scale well it's actually a mix of scales you'll see it tomorrow so I just wanted to say that so in the meantime while I'm waiting for the studio to heat up a little bit so I can work in there um, I decided I would do a game spotlight I haven't done these in a while and I'm trying, they, they come out periodically, these videos. And for those of you that don't know, MJ Gaming Spotlight is just a uh, video where I take out a random rule set from my game library and go over it. Basically go over the core mechanics of the game. Uh, it's a very informal video. I don't go into a lot of depth, but I am trying a few new things for this series. And uh, so hope you like them. So basically just to give a little exposure to the game and at the same time, you know, uh, show what's in my collection. So uh, today we're going to be going over a game called Of Gods and Mortals. Okay. And uh, I'm again, I'm trying something a little different for these videos. We're going to go over the rules and... Um, some of the things that I will be using for this game. I will pl be playing this game. Now this game, um, what caught my attention, uh, and I have this game for quite some time now. Uh, this is published by Osprey Games. The author is Andreas Figaloa. And, uh, well, that attracted me because that author is also the author of Song of Blades and Heroes and Advanced Song of Blades and Heroes. Uh, which is the, sort of the newer version. And that's a great little rule set. I will be going over Advanced Song of Blades and Heroes, putting it on the spotlight sometime in the future. So I know this author already, and I know he's a very good author. Um, I like his games. So let's go over Of Gods and Mortals. Now you're going to see me looking down a lot because I have the book. Like I said, I'm going to be trying something different for these little videos. Um and so I'm just going to go over the book, and then you'll see images uh, popping up periodically of the things I'm looking at. Um, so this is a 64-page book. Um, most of the important rules uh, go up to like page 28 or so, right? And then after that, you get a lot of the other uh, necessary things. We'll go over that in just a minute. So... One of the things I really like about the, the what this author chose as a theme is that uh, this game is an alternate history game with real mythology introduced into it. And that's kind of a, a, an oxymoron, real and then mythology. But basically with mythological elements and alternate history. So you're using real uh, historical armies such as the Greek army, you know, uh, Egyptian, uh, Roman, right? And mixing it with actual mythological elements. So uh, that's what I really like about the, the game. Um, so we can have, uh, and of course, the, the uh, leaders of your army will be the whatever mythological god you choose. So, for example, we'll have Zeus, uh, um, and we'll have, you know, Anubis for the Egyptian armies, uh, etc. So really cool concept. So what you need to play, you according to the book, is at least three dice per players. And these are D6, okay? Uh, you'll need 16 to 20 miniatures. That's what the book recommends. Obviously, we modify those and you can have bigger games or sometimes even smaller games if you just want to learn the rules, right? Uh, so that's, but that's the advisable number of miniatures. Uh, three measuring sticks. Now here's the same mechanic as Advanced Song of Blades and Heroes. And I use my own little uh, creation 
for these kinds of games this is actually interchangeable it has a little clothespin there I just take out the sticks and so when I need a short stick I put in my short stick or a long stick whatever it is and this works really well because um, of the handle when I have since I play with a lot of terrain this allows me to get the measurements in cramped areas so I can move my minis it's not terribly accurate but it really works for me so it's a cool little uh, thing to kind of uh, get your measurements and I, I use that in many different games not just games like this that use measuring sticks all right so back to it so measuring sticks uh, it gives it to you the measurements in centimeters but basically short medium and long uh, a plain surface of at least three feet by three feet so it's not going to be very big tables and that's good um, and then a couple of old CDs and cardboard triangles to be used as movement trays. Now that's interesting, and that's because of the formation mechanic that this game uses, okay? Um, and then, of course, terrain. You're going to need some kind of terrain. Uh, so nothing really spectacular. If you want to use historically-based terrain, you can, okay? Now, the game length... It says it's about uh, anywhere from under an hour to an hour. And obviously, this changes depending how many miniatures you use and all that good stuff. Um, the book has awesome art. And one of the things I like about uh, what this author did in this book, he uses a lot of examples of miniatures and actual terrain. Nicely set up, you know, diorama style terrain. So that's pretty cool. I always like when books use actual miniatures it gives you an idea of what to use so uh, getting into the now into the core mechanics of the book um, one important thing that the author does is that any kind of tactical um, advice he gives it to you in uh, italics I, it's bolded and then italicized so when you see a little uh, italicized box that's telling you that it's either a tactic or designers notes or uh, play hints things like that and then important rules are actually highlighted in bold throughout the text so that's cool because you know it just when you see a bold uh, sentences you know right away oh this is a core rule this is important to follow out of all the other rules this stands out so that's a cool thing that the author does um, now let's uh, just talk about the three tiered power system uh, three tiered power is that each unit in the game belongs to one of these three tiers so you have single figures which are your gods and your legends we'll talk about that in just a second then you have open order units or closed order units closed order units are more your rank and file so this would be your disciplined mili you know disciplined infantry and stuff like that um, they would be in rank and tight rank and file formations uh, probably regiment trays would be the best thing to uh, have these units uh, in formation. Then you have the open order unit, which is what the author uh, used. That's why he mentioned the CD, because uh, you take an old CD and that becomes your tray for the open order unit. Um, and these are more loose formations, uh, like the Celts would use, right? Uh, the Celt armies sort of more open formation large formations open formations not really your rank and file like your Roman or your Greek you know those kinds of armies had so that's an interesting thing I, I, I like that whole three tiered power system it's just a way to organize your armies and it has uh, an important part in how the armies play so uh, each force is gonna have a god and again, you choose your god. There's a bunch of gods here. And then the book also gives you examples uh, so that you can make your own pantheons and stuff. So that's really cool. Um, so the god is going to be leading the army. And then you have your legends. These are your demigods, kind of lower deities. They're still more powerful than mortals, and they're still immortals, right? But they're just directly below the gods so they're like you're almost like your second in command although the book doesn't refer to them that way um, 
but they're powerful enough to be able to be called gods, but could still be defeated by mortals, okay? So a well-coordinated mortal attack can take down a uh, legendary figure. So those are the three tier tiers, uh, gods, legends, and then you have your mortal uh, mortals. And mortals are not just humans in this game, also centaurs, satyrs, those kinds of mythological creatures. I really like that. That was pretty cool. So your profiles, the book goes into profiles on page six, uh, very simple profiles. You do have a quality stat, just like in his other games, okay? Uh, you have a combat score. Then you have, of course, the points value and whatever special abilities the unit has. I, I usually see like two or three abilities. That's cool because sometimes games with a lot of uh, special abilities for one unit, I tend to forget to use, you know, a special ability because there's so many of them listed, you know. So this is pretty cool. It keeps things pretty simple. Um so close combat, uh, close or open orders, we just went over that. Um, it does have a point system. And then um, there are also restrictions and options that the every profiles give you. So, for example, for Odysseus the Cunning, that's the example it gives you in the book, um, he has the option of having a bow. So you would add the shooter trait um, and... Uh, good shot for 20 points i that's just a special ability haven't gone over all the special abilities but that's what that means okay and uh, uh quality of course refers to the unit's uh willingness to fight and how well they fight in combat okay so that's simple enough so uh it goes into getting started uh how to build your force it about 900 points is about 17 models, as the book says. Okay, um, you are always going to have a god. He's going to be the leader. Uh, and one through to five legendary figures. Okay, so uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, legendary figures. We'll go over the, a few of them in just a second. Um, some gods will have an undead theme. And this part of the book covers that. For example, Anubis. So you can have skellies. Oh, love skellies, right? And then uh, there are some example forces as well. Now, the game, you will have to determine who's the attacker and who's the defender. And this is going to affect um, uh, things like initiative and so forth. So now uh, the game is uh, the core mechanics also utilizes activations and reactions. So activation system is the same as an advanced Song of Blades and Heroes. You're going to decide whether you give the unit that you chose one, two, or three actions. You're going to roll that many number of dice. So if you chose to give that unit two actions, Right? right in between, you're going to roll two dice. It's based on successes and failures. Depending how many successes you get, that's the number of actions. How many failures you get, a uh, play could pass to your opponent. So, a uh, roll of one is always a failure, of course, and a roll of six is always a success. So, that's the core mechanic. There is a whole table that gives you what happens with each of the uh, activation results. So if you roll one failure, if you roll one success, if you roll two successes, one failure, you know, that kind of thing. The table gives you what the result is, okay? So whether you perform an action or uh, whether play passes to the opponent, you know. So that table, I usually like to photocopy that and print it out just to have it. Of course, if you have the book, I mean, obviously, you can just use the book. But I like to have a separate little table for that. Um, there are reactions. So basically, uh, the interesting part is that reactions, um, uh, your opponent can uh, react to your activation. Uh, but uh, your opponent reacts with a tier that's equal to or higher than the unit you are activating. So if you're activating an infantry unit, which is a, a mortal unit, right? Um, your opponent can decide to activate 
with uh, to react with either one of their infantry units or a legend or even a god or even his god, right? So uh, an opponent's reactions will take place before your own unit's actions. So that's important. So before you get to even uh, activate that unit, the opponent may decide to do a reaction. That's, of course, optional. It depends on the opponent, but it's definitely uh, there. Okay, so um, so if you roll a failure with one of your legends, this is the example that the book gives, your opponent may immediately attempt a reaction with either one of his legends or with his god. He may not react with one of his mortal units, okay? So that's an interesting part of the mechanic. Um, and, of course, it goes over the turnover, uh, the actions. What kinds of actions are there? There's a little table there for, like, Movement, that's one action point. You do get action points. That's the way I look at it. Um, a unit with uh, short move and having to move over difficult terrain costs two action points. Okay, so things like that. So that is also part of the mechanic. And we see this in uh, a few of the other authors' games. So if you've played Event Song of Blades and Heroes, this is going to be very, very familiar. Um there is uh, something called invocation, which I thought was interesting on page 12 of the rule book. And uh, an invocation can be used by a mortal unit um, to summon a god back that has been slain. That's very interesting. You can also give an extra activation dice to a god by doing an invocation. I imagine a uh, priest's would be able to do this, right? If you have like a priestly figure as part of your mortals. So that's pretty cool. Um, that is that. And there is summoning and then that kind of stuff is covered. Now, the book goes into uh, examples of movement. It has good uh, graphics for that. And it pretty much shows you the correct way of measuring your movement and the incorrect way, right? Um, and so it shows you how uh, rank and file troops move, et cetera, et cetera. Um, obstacles, linear obstacles. So it goes a little bit into terrain, how to classify the different uh, terrain and so forth. So not too bad. Uh, flying units. Uh, flying units can actually move through other units in this game. So that's cool. I feel that sometimes flying units in other systems... I, I don't know, it's almost like they're, um, I don't know if it's the right word to say, but almost limited in some cases, right? Uh, in this book, it's in this rule set, it's, it's cool that flying units are able to go over other units, and they also uh, ignore terrain and all that, you know? So uh, with combat, I'm not going to go over everything that it says, but um, there is free hacks allowed, that's very much like Advanced Song of Blades and Heroes. You roll a single dice for each of the unit of, of the attacking unit, um, adding the unit's combat score and any relevant modifiers. So you take your C2, you your C combat, sorry, your combat score, you add that to your dice roll. Whoever has the highest, because it is an opposed roll system, whoever has the highest number is the one that wins the combat. It inflicts one casualty, and so you remove casualties by removing models off the tray, you know, and this is for uh, any of the either rank and file or the other one open order uh, units, okay? So, and then it also talks about uh, things like awe, um, for example, a unit of mortals that is blasted by some godly energy that gives them awe and uh, basically the attacking unit, the, the one inflicting the awe gets a plus three in melee because of the awe that he's causing to his enemy. So that's an interesting little mechanic thing. Um, it goes through legendary casualties, how that works, god casualties, how that works, what happens when your god dies, you know, that kind of thing. There is a recoiling 
a mechanic added to combat. So if you charge and you lose the combat, whoever loses the combat recoils. Okay, that's pretty much that's seen in, in, in a few systems. Um, there is a yield no ground, and it only happens uh, when the god is still on the table. It, the unit does not recoil, but it takes an extra casualty. Okay, so instead of recoiling, it stays there in combat, but it does take an extra casualty, and yield no ground is like an order that you can give. Uh, pretty cool. Okay, um, and basically the combat section is going to give you a lot of different situations that may arise in combat. It's not bad. Um, there's powerful attacks, there's ambush bonuses, odd, there's mounted units, there's size, how size affects unit. Uh, combat, so big, huge, gargantuan, okay, uh, we then get into the line of sight section, that's on page 24 or so, and how ranged attacks work, so pretty standard in that sense, so uh, again, the core mechanic of the game uses successes and failures in combat, it is an opposed role system with whoever has the highest number, wins so you're basically rolling those dice adding those combat scores and any modifiers and whoever wins the combat inflicts a casualty so that's pretty cool you do have morale in this game and uh basically the book goes uh on page 28 that's where the rules section ends the end of the game basically how you end the games and everything else it talks about campaigns and things like that okay so that's pretty good again lots of wonderful artwork really really cool artwork in this game um, so then the book around page 30 um, it goes into traits and these are all those special abilities and things uh, things like ambusher uh, amphibious bard big all these things are described here in this section. There's about eight pages of traits. So you have a lot of traits, which is good because uh, that'll tell you what all the traits are in the little uh, stat columns. But it, and, and it gives you a nice variety. So your, your uh, units, your forces are going to have a nice little variety of special abilities. So... Um, there's a ton. I'm not going to go over all of them, but there's there's one lightning. Always love lightning. Um, release the kraken. Hmm, that's an interesting one. So uh, basically, even teleportation. So we're going to move on from that. So then it goes into a slight uh, scenario section. Um, showdown, sacred grove, spring of youth. Um, and it's not very long, though. It's not very detailed. It's just kind of mentions a couple of scenarios. A battle in a sacred city. That sounds really interesting. And one of the cool things is that gods or models with the big, huge, or gargantuan uh, trait, they can smash buildings. And that's pretty cool. Like in a city setting, have some markers of maybe on a CD or something some uh, flat-ish ruined markers and place them, uh, replace a building with one of those every time a god or something smashes a building. That's kind of cool. So you could see the city being leveled as, as you go. So page 48, now you begin to get into your list of gods and your list of legends and mortals for the game. And so this is where all of the uh, unit types are being uh, described and so one example for the Greek gods is Athena you can have an Athena uh, based army she's 248 points um, and you have Greek gods like Hermes Zeus very cool and legends include harpies oh, I, I didn't look at harpies that way but that's pretty cool you know, so they're legendary. They're not just mere mortals. And then Minotaurs, Kerberos, okay, uh, Pegasus. These are all uh, legends. And then for mortals, here's where the mortals don't have to be human. Mortals can be satyrs. They can be centaurs, dryads or dryads, um, Amazon hoplites. Cool. So those are all examples of mortals in the Greek 
sort of uh, army. But you also have Egyptians, and you have Horus, Thoth, Anubis, Set, right? And there are a ton of Egyptian gods. Uh, and this is where I plan to sculpture a couple of Egyptian gods, uh, Sobek being one of my favorite gods, that uh, dude with the crocodile head. He's like the god of water, god of the Nile. Um, so there's a lot of ways you can represent that god. And also Hyro Hyraco Sphinxes, right? Or the falcon-headed sphinx. There, there's a difference between the two. The Hyraco Sphinx, I think, is the one with the human head uh, and sphinx body. So very cool. I mean, you can do so much in terms of uh, conversions for this, right? And I'm sure I'll talk about this when I'm ready to play the game. But you can probably use a lot of cheap um, uh, toy figures, animal toy figures out there. There's some nicely detailed ones that are not as expensive as some of the wargaming miniature animals that, that they sell out there. And you can uh, do some conversions and have like lions and crocodiles and bears and other kinds of things uh, with your army. So that's pretty good. So we go into all of that and we have the Norse, the Celts. Um, I don't see Romans in here, but I'm sure that can be easily made up. Then the book goes into the appendix. Now, I love when authors do this. When they have an appendix in the rule book, it really helps. Um, the appendix one and appendix two, it goes over more than two players. So what do you do in the rules when you have more than two players? Uh, the point system, very important. And this is another section I like. This allows you to make up your own pantheons, your own mortals, your own legends. Very, very good. And one of the nice things is that it gives you tables with base costs of the unit's quality, you know, how you how you assign quality to that unit, and how much does each trait cost. So instead of giving me an equation, and I know that the equations are very easy, they're usually just basic math, but it's nice when they just give you the number, right? I don't have to do anything, just say, okay, I want to give this guy the artificial trait, well, it costs two points, so I'm going to do that. You see, so you come up with your point system very easily, and you can create your own own gods, your own pantheons, right? So, and it, it goes through the three tiers, mortals, legends, and gods. And then at the very end of the book, page 64, you get your quick reference sheet summarizing all the rules, the important rules in the book. Again, another cool tip. And that's where the book ends, and... Uh, I'm really interested in this game. So how am I going to play um, Gods and Mortals? And uh, again, this is my opinion and my opinion only. I'm going to be using a mix of scales and uh, 172 scale for my Mortals, uh, 28 millimeter for my Legends because they're going to be a little bit bigger. And for my Gods, even bigger than that. Okay, so um, probably more like 32 or even 40 millimeter um, I'm going to be using a mixture of sculptures and actual uh, figures, large figures. Uh, for example, uh, in the Reaper range, there's the Horus, right? And uh, I mean, that's a nice figure. I really like that. I, I have mixed feelings about Reaper bones. Some of the ones I've purchased in the past are not really that good in terms of detail. But this guy is really cool. And a good size, he matches my sculpture of Anubis. Uh, just a little bit bigger, but it definitely would work. And then uh, for some of the legends, these 28 millimeter uh, female figures would be good as Vacaries. I know there's Vacaries somewhere in here. And I could maybe make them legends. So these are going to be big female Vacaries that come out, right? Uh, so they're going to be taller than the 172 scale mortals. So now for... Uh, centaurs, uh, what would I do? I would probably take 172 scale cavalry figures of something, uh, maybe a Roman cavalry or whatever. Um, cut the torsos of the men, cut the heads off the horse, and then use a little green stuff and make my own centaurs. Uh, that's just one idea. I'm sure there's other uh, things I could use to represent centaurs, but that's definitely one idea and I might actually do that and just make a little video and see if I'm successful, but it would be really cool. Uh, you have to make your cuts 
precise um, so that they can fit on the heads of the horse and you're gonna and to replace the heads of the horse and uh, you will need some green stuff or procreate clay to do some filling and, and or even milliput for that matter so that's my idea that's uh, sort of a new little segment I'm including into the videos talk about the miniatures that I would use this is a miniature agnostic game very important um, so you're gonna be using whatever miniatures you want or have so let me know in the comments what miniatures would you use if you were gonna play this game uh, what scale uh, I'm gonna be using a mixture of scales to represent the different tiers the different sizes that's just me uh, but you know let me know what you think and of course there will be sculptures I will announce these sculptures uh, when I'm close to playing the game and of course give myself plenty of time so I have those sculptures ready for our first game and uh and then of course julie will join me she'll have to learn the game and uh that's it so folks that's all for today i'm sorry if this video is a little longer than intended i am trying to uh change uh, improve my methods a little bit for the game spotlights and give information that might be useful or of interest all right so thank you very much folks for joining me and again Today's game uh, should be just about warm enough in the studio. I'll be filming that game today and hopefully by tomorrow, depending on the editing, how long it takes me, uh, that game will go up. It's a 15 millimeter scale OPR regimen scheme. All right. So thank you very much, folks. And we'll be back with another gaming spotlight sometime soon. Have a good day and take care.